Dr. Suzanne Humphreys is a highly educated specialist in internal medicine and nephrology. She worked as a kidney specialist when she started questioning the safety of vaccines. She saw cases of kidney failure shortly after patients had been vaccinated during the flu season. After a lot of research, she wrote a book together with Roman Bistrianic called Dissolving Illusions, Disease, Vaccines and the Forgotten History. We met her during a lecture tour in Scandinavia and started by letting her explain the method of vaccination. Well, vaccination is an attempt to expose the body to a hopefully benign form of the disease so that the body can respond as if it were infected with the disease without getting sick and then can hopefully have memory of that infection for the future if it is exposed to the actual natural infection. Mm -hmm. The problem is that A, it, vaccines do not come into the body by and large the same way um, as the natural infection does. For instance, measles is inhaled, but the vaccine is injected. That means that it has an exposure to the nervous system much more quickly through injection than it would through the normal inhalation and processing of the lymphatic system. Also, the vaccines don't just contain little bits of the bacteria or the virus or an inactivated virus. It also contains other chemicals, which the natural disease would not have. And do you think this idea of vaccination, do you think that this is working? Do you think that this is a good method of keeping, keeping a, a population healthy? You have to define working first, okay? Some people consider working means that you've suppressed a disease in a population. Some vaccines do work by that definition, but no vaccines increase the health of a population because vaccines do not increase the health of a human. There's nothing in a vaccine that our bodies actually require. We don't require aluminum. We don't require mercury, polysorbate 80. We don't require um, formaldehyde. And those are some of the things that are commonly in vaccines. So there's no nutritive effect of a vaccine. So I don't know, I don't believe that vaccines create health in a population and I believe that there are always better ways to deal with diseases in a population than vaccinating anybody. Now the pro-vaccine people, they say that with the vaccine a number of diseases just disappeared from uh, populations. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you react to that? Well, I would have to address each vaccine that they claim this to be true for. And I have gone through and looked at the smallpox history. And what we find with smallpox is that, uh, first of all, that there was a town in England called Leicester. And that was a town that had, was highly vaccinated and they were still having epidemics of smallpox and death from smallpox. That town decided to stop vaccinating. They were warned that they were going to set a bonfire of disaster upon the earth because they stopped vaccinating. But what happened was that their disease rates declined as did their death rates from smallpox decline. So that is an example that shows you um, that stopping vaccinating actually can improve the disease in the population. And that I looked at smallpox first because that's the disease that most people say was eradicated by vaccines. But only five to 10% of the Earth's population was ever vaccinated for smallpox. And it was done during a time when uh, there was lots of sanitation occurring, which meant that there, was, uh, there were fewer rodents and um, insects around that were able to carry the disease from person to person. It meant that people's immune systems were improved because of better nutrition and child labor laws. Um, so there were lots of things occurring during this period when smallpox disappeared. However, now, you know, back during the time of smallpox, there was chicken pox, monkey pox, goat pox, horse pox. There were all kinds of pox that looked identical, were very difficult to tell apart. 
we still have monkey pox on the planet. So many of these pox diseases uh, that we all lump together because we didn't have genetic testing, we still have these diseases. If you look at a person, a victim of monkey pox, it looks just like smallpox. So the question is, did we really eradicate smallpox? And I have my doubts about that. Okay, so let's get back to tetanus because we're often told that, um, you know, once we gave this vaccine, we saw this enormous drop in death and cases. And we're shown this graph here. And it really does look like, you know, the tetanus vaccine came in around here. And look, we have this ski slope coming down. But the problem is, and this is, the, this is how you'll be shown uh, by the public health authorities, all the vaccines success. Uh, they don't show you the whole graph. Here's what happens when you look at the whole graph. Uh, we can see that it was already coming down and then it came down further. But look at how much more dramatic it was in England and Wales. And we can see that the, the decline in, in incidence of mortality is here and the vaccine came in here. And we actually see it come up a little bit um, after the vaccine came in. And this is the same thing uh, in Canada. You know, we see that uh, the death rate from tetanus, they only started reporting cases here, but we can see the death rate was, was just precipitously falling. And this is the year the vaccines came in. And again, we see for some strange reason an increase right there, but we can't say that we, we have tetanus vaccines to thank because the, the trend was already seriously coming down. Is there a danger vaccinating populations as we do today? Well, that's a complicated question. And I would say that adequate research has not been done. What we would need to do would be to look at a vaccinated population versus a not vaccinated population, and not just for one vaccine. See, uh, the pro-vaccine will say that we have these studies, we've done them, but it's only one vaccine, and they call it a vaccinated, unvaccinated study, when just missing one vaccine would qualify you as unvaccinated by their definition. So we can't do a study where we purposefully take people at birth and vaccinate half of them and don't vaccinate the other half. That would never be agreed upon by uh, authorities. But what we can do is look at populations that are already not vaccinated, that live in the same place and are virtually identical in as many ways as possible as those that are vaccinated. And if you have a large enough group, you can tell the difference between them as far as disease rates go. Now, are they safe? You know, even uh, the um, Supreme Court of the United States uh, ruled last year that vaccines are, um, there's an inherent lack of safety uh, some of the time. And so, because we know that vaccine adverse events occur, we have uh, a system in place to compensate some of the people that this occurs for but we don't have a system in place to compensate everyone that this occurs for. In fact, it's the vast minority of claims actually ever get compensated for. So just given this little bit of information I've told you, you have to wonder, are vaccines safe? Can you say that they're safe? What do you say? <laughs> I say nobody has proven to me that they're safe that I have scientific reason to believe that the components that are in them and how they act upon the immune system and the potential for autoimmunity and cancers and neurologic diseases is there. And so I cannot say, uh, guarantee that these vaccines are safe, not even one of them, let alone numerous vaccines in the childhood vaccination program given earlier and earlier and more and more. And what you might notice, if, if you've been in the middle of this problem yourself, is that the people who want to vaccinate um, are often very aggressive and they don't want you to hear the other side. And that should make a light bulb in your head go off. Why don't they want me to hear the other side? Why don't they think I can actually listen to both and come up with my own decision? See, I will never tell you not to vaccinate but they will always tell you to vaccinate for everything. That alone, I believe, should be a red flag to you, that I'm saying you listen to everything and then you choose. What you do is your responsibility. And that's not what the, what the, what the people who are supporting this aggressive vaccination campaigns, more and more vaccines all the time to little babies. You told uh, in, on the lecture, you spoke about methods that authorities use mm -hmm. to make people go and vaccinate. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Well, yes, I can. 
the methods, uh, I showed you the exact quote from the New York Times from a Center for Disease Control doctor who said, literally, that fear is used in order to stimulate the masses to take vaccines. Uh, this has been done for a long time, is that pictures of um, dying babies, uh, pictures of children with uh, warped limbs from polio, and all kinds of uh, visual material is given out. Um, there's usually uh, a consent form that tells you to consent, but doesn't tell you the risks of the vaccine, doesn't tell you that there may be any other way to deal with the disease if it occurs. Influenza is a great example. And we know that with the influenza vaccine, uh, that it is not a highly effective vaccine. And even the Cochrane Collaborative Database has said that the um, hype um, and the lack of science around that we see in public, in the media, and even in medical journals is not consistent with the science that we have. So there's not only fear, but there's lots of misinformation and, uh, and suppression, or I should say with, withholding of information that is known by those of us who have um, practiced alternative medicine, because we know that nutrition, hand washing, vitamin C, vitamin D, selenium are all things that uh, not only can help with viral infections, but can keep the immune system functioning properly. This is a PowerPoint presentation that comes from Mayo Clinic. This is a, a very prestigious institution in USA, and this is one of our leading vaccine promoters in USA. And he made a PowerPoint presentation to give to all doctors uh, to help them talk to people who don't want to vaccinate. And I just took out a couple of slides to show you. It was a very long presentation, but he basically is coaching these doctors um, how to deal with you. Uh, they say, don't plan on giving you any printed information. Don't plan on emailing you any links to information. Does that seem a little strange? They're saying not to give you the information. They said, instead, read and remember. Well, that's not happening. I can guarantee you that. This, I think, is the worst, most egregious statement here, which is he's telling them to persuade you rather to than inform you. Um, doctors also are not told the whole truth, and I think that's one of the big problems, is that uh, doctors are not taught about um, the problems with vaccination that can occur, and some doctors have actually been burned themselves that way. I showed you a slide today with the name of a doctor whose daughter had a serious reaction to human papillomavirus vaccine, and he had no idea beforehand that this was a problem, this is a, that this was a potential problem. And I think that every parent has the right to know, even if it's a small percentage of people that this has happened in, they have a right to know about it. And I think the biggest problem I have is that parents aren't given equally weighted information. They're given highly biased information. So that's another technique that's used is I showed you the other slide from uh, the Mayo Clinic, which said to persuade rather than to inform. I also think this is uh, uh, injustice to parents all over the world who are being persuaded rather than informed. Uh, and when uh, when the authorities uh, tell the people to to vaccinate, they are uh, very sure. They seem very sure that this is the right thing to do. But on the other hand, when listening to your lecture, reading your book, they are not. Uh, they haven't really studied the whole picture, the subject of vaccination. Well, I don't know what the authorities have actually studied. Um, the authorities and I don't really speak very much. Um, I think that a lot of them actually believe what they're doing, and I think that a lot of doctors are, have their own fear. They don't want to see their patients develop these diseases, and they really believe that the vaccines will prevent them, and they believe that the vaccines are safe. So uh, I think that a lot of it has to do with kind of a religious belief in vaccination that even the World Health Organization may have. You have been a doctor for a long time, and you have the... Uh you, ha you b used to believe in vaccination and you have even given people vaccination mm. yourself and uh, after uh, some circumstances you have you done your research mm -hmm. uh, how did you feel uh, during the time that you did your research uh, well I really just felt motivated more than anything 
because I realized that I was miseducated and I realized there was a huge problem going on around me in the hospital my fa that my family members had been exposed to, um, that friends had, and that there was just so much misinformation to get through. And so mostly I just felt um, motivated to learn as much as I could because I found that knowledge um, made my, um, you know, my, my new beliefs about the problems have more weight. And I think that if we want to make an argument for anything, we need to have as much knowledge as we can. So it's really been my priority to read and read and read and understand as much of the science and the medical literature as possible. But how, how did you react? Did you feel like betrayed? Uh, or Because you, you, you went from uh, being totally uh, convinced that vaccination is a very good thing to do mm -hmm. to a, a b more skeptical uh, point. Well, I take responsibility for, for what I've done in my life. And so if, I, if somebody made me go to medical school and kept everything away from me, maybe I would feel betrayed. But I chose to go to medical school. And I chose to limit my reading material to the degree that I did. So I didn't feel betrayed. I'm, I'm more of somebody who, when I see a problem, I, I, I grab it by the horns and I deal with it. And so that's what I did when I started uh, this. What I realized is that it wasn't just the only area in medicine that I had not learned the full spectrum of information. And it wasn't the only area of medicine where the people that were teaching me didn't even understand um, as much as they needed to understand to make the statements that they were making, that there are other areas, you know, even treating high blood pressure um, turned out not to be uh, taught to me the way that I would want to do now, now that I have read more and understand more about the way the body really works. So if anything, once I understood the problems with vaccination, it had me looking more at other areas of medicine. And I think that's one of the fears that the medical system has, is that if doctors start to see the big crack in one area, that that crack will spread to other areas and they will start to doubt the way I did, um, the integrity of the medical system and where the funding is coming into the medical system and how limited our view and our knowledge uh, has been and we are told that so many things are quackery, when in fact the things that the medical system calls quackery are what I now see helping the most. And so I think the term quackery really needs to be redefined because in the time that I have become a quack, myself and my patients have become healthier than they ever were at the time when I was not a quack. Now you said <laughs> yourself that uh, even if you go abroad to different countries uh, known for diseases and such, uh, you wouldn't take any vaccine at all. Why? Because I take really good care of my immune system and my body. And I, I believe that uh, if you, it, it's always a gamble, right? So you have to pick which side you're gonna run with and you have to believe in it and do it, okay? So if you're gonna believe in vaccines, then you need to believe in it and do it. I don't believe in vaccines. I don't even believe a little bit in vaccines. Uh, I believe that they can do more harm to me that I may never be able to make up for. And I know that, that I am capable, my immune system is capable of handling diseases and that I can enhance my immune system, that I can give my immune system the nutrients that it needs, that I can avoid the circumstances and situations that would expose me to different diseases. So I, that is my approach, and, and it's insofar as, as taking the odds, to me, for per, me personally, the odds are in not vaccinating and having some wisdom about how these diseases occur and doing what I can to A, not contract it, and B, be ready if I do contract it to deal with whatever happens. Now, the vaccine uh, uh, are being sold in to third world countries, poor countries like Africa, as an aid by very uh, powerful people like Bill Gates, for example, mm -hmm. um, what do you think? What do you what do you think about that? Well, I read this week that it would only cost thirty billion dollars to end world hunger, and um, as Roman and I showed in our book, was that it was nutrition was one of the biggest reasons for uh, the problems in the susceptibility and the death rates for diseases. 
Other problems included um, lack of hygiene and inadequate water supplies, clean water supplies. So what I believe is that um, Bill Gates and the billionaires of the world could really get together much the way that the wealthy did in the UK and USA. It was the wealthy that did this, most of these changes is that they could get together and they could not only end world hunger, but they could be planting sustainable gardens and that they could be enhancing the water supply. Now they do a little of that, but I think they could do enough of it that, that the third world could change as far as disease susceptibility to the, to the degree that ours is and that the vaccines would then become perceptibly not necessary. This is from a, a little magazine that is very highly read in America. It's very popular called Reader's Digest. And Kathleen Sebelius is our Secretary of Health and Human Services, a very high level position in government. And she said um, that there are groups out there like me uh, who um, say that vaccines are responsible for problems. And they say that um, we have reached out to the media to try to get the media not to give me uh, my view uh, or equal weight uh, because she says the science has already shown the safety and effectiveness of vaccination, so my voice should not be heard. Um, I couldn't disagree with that more um, because the more science I know, the more indignant and upset I get because I know that the science shows major problems with the theory of vaccination and with the practice of vaccination.